I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. One of the most difficult aspects in starting to study Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah is getting a handle on just how those ideas developed over time. It's tempting to think that, for instance, Kabbalah has just always existed in the form that we have it, or that Kabbalah is just one thing at all. Of course, neither of these positions is really tenable. Such notions developed greatly through the ages and are still developing, and there are now and there have always been numerous mutually exclusive schools of Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah. This class is meant to serve as an introduction to Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah from the point of view of its incredibly complex development from the prophets of ancient Israel unto the rise of modern Hasidism in the 18th century. Of course, this series isn't meant to be exhaustive by any means, but only should serve as a springboard for deeper study and reflection, and hopefully it will also enable you to accentuate developments in Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah in their historical and cultural context, and hopefully embolden you to dive into the primary texts, which are admittedly as sublime as they are obscure. Let me express my gratitude to Congregation Tchia for allowing me to use these lectures to reach a larger audience here on Esoterica. If you want, you can find the entire series under the playlist Entering the Garden, an Introduction to Jewish Mysticism and Kabbalah. I'll be uploading them over the next few weeks, or if you find these episodes after autumn of 2021 and you want to watch the entire series, you can find them in that playlist. If you find this series on Kabbalah interesting, I'd hope you check out my other content on topics in esotericism and perhaps consider supporting the production of free academic and scholarly topics in occultism, hermetic philosophy, by joining my Patreon or perhaps with a one-time donation. You can find those links below, and I really appreciate your consideration. Now, let's enter the garden of Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah. All right, folks. So let's do some recap, and let's get into... Um, Let's get into the Zohar. Um, so as we talked about last time, Kabbalah, Kabbalah, the, the, the technical Kabbalah, the Kabbalah proper really begins to exist in southern France and Spain in the early 13th century. Now, it's really important to note that it doesn't come out of whole cloth, right? That's the whole point of this class, that we've been tracing how Jewish mysticism has developed uh, in the world of uh, Palestine, in the world of, of uh, Babylonia, in the world of uh, Jewish magic in Egypt. And we've been tracing how that's being slowly moving into the European context. And it's in that situation, beginning in the early 13th century, maybe the late 12th century, <laughs> that, um, that Kabbalah begins to exist as such. And as we talked about last time, some of the driving issues, and I don't want to say the only driving issues, but some of the more important driving issues are one, a response against the philosophy of Maimonides, right? We like to claim Maimonides, especially as progressive Jews, as sort of the beacon of enlightenment. But Maimonides, as I pointed out last time, was incredibly polarizing. Maimonides was not universally accepted by, by many Jews. There were many, many Jews that hated him and literally turned his books over to, to the Dominicans to have them burned. Of course, that was a pretty bad idea because when the Dominicans were like, hey, you want me, you, ha you have these heretical books, we want you to, we, we want to burn them. Can we burn some more books? And of course, they ended up famously burning the Talmud. So be careful who you get to burn your books. Uh, in general, my advice to you is don't let anyone burn your books. Uh, hold your enemies close and uh, don't let them burn your books. At any rate, so we have this idea in Maimonides of, um, of this sort of rational, hyper uh, metaphorical understanding of everything from angels to the body of God. And of course, the mystics were very interested in the body of God, the actual body of God that you could measure in the, the Persian Parasang unit. And they were very interested in the idea that you could travel to go into the realm of God and sit on God's throne and maybe even be transformed into an angel. And Maimonides thought that this was just a complete nightmare um, of idolatry and paganism. 
And so he really tried to get rid of this. And so in some ways, the Kabbalah is a response against Maimonides. I think the second thing that's really driving uh, the rise of Kabbalah is what sometimes I call the gap problem. And this gap problem really comes from the inheritance of Neoplatonic philosophy. Now, I know, again, I want to drive this point home, that I know that many of us have been raised with the idea that mysticism and philosophy, rationalism and mysticism, um, uh, logic and, uh, and mysticism cannot stay together. They cannot live in the same roof and they can't be in the same bed. Well, the Middle Ages does not give a damn about what you think about those things. The, the Middle Ages is a mixed up, interesting, different place than what you've ever imagined. And the truth of the matter is, philosophy and mysticism, logic and religion have remained very close bedfellows, bedfellows for a long time. And the fact that we post-Enlightenment, post-Haskalah Jews want to drive a hard wedge between them says more about what we need and our desires, our perversions maybe, than it does about what philosophically is rigorous and what historical people actually did. And so part of what's going to happen is that it's not that the Kabbalists are going to reject philosophy, it's that they're going to marshal a different kind of philosophy to solve philosophical problems. Now, their philosophy is going to look a lot different than the way we do philosophy now, but that doesn't mean it's not philosophy. And as I pointed out last time, the big problem they're trying to figure out is how to bridge the gap between the, the infinite transcendence of God and the imminent reality of God. And what's going to emerge in their solution, and we're going to see this in a big way tonight, beginning in the, our, our, our analysis of the Sefer Zohar, is they're going to try to have the cake and eat it too, because that's what every philosopher does, right? Read the first line of the logic of Hegel, right? Nothingness plus being equals becoming. There we go, right? Get your cake and eat it too, right? You get nothing and you get being and you get becoming. There we go. And we roll on out with becoming. So <clears throat> philosophers are always trying to have their cake and eat it too. And so it's not surprising the Kabbalists are going to do the same thing. And their solution, just to be very brief right here, is going to be basically three parts. They're going to maintain the transcendence of God with the concept of Ein Sof, the infinite. We'll get to that tonight. They're going to abridge the gap between the infinite distance of God and Ein Sof to our reality with the Sephirot, right? We'll get to them tonight to new, right? And then they're going to talk about how God is imminent to our world, right? God is imminent. God is, it, I love the line in the, in the Quran, actually, which is not part of the, obviously, Jewish mysticism, but I think it's the most beautiful line of the Quran, is that Allah is closer to you than your jugular vein, right? I love that image, right? That like Allah is closer to you than your jugular vein. And this image is deeply true of the Zohar as well, that, that the imminent world of God, the Shekhinah, the feminine world, is as close to you as your bride, right? Now, again, this is a bunch of dudes writing dude stuff and dude times. And so who are they going to talk about who's really close to them? Their bride, all right? The, the, the woman they're taking to bed or Sometimes the dude, they're also taken to bed, right? It, you can see there's a lot of homoeroticism that we're going to see also, of course, in the Zohar as well. And so what's going on here, right, is that they're trying to just explain also the experience of imminence, and that's going to be the Shekhinah, the indwelling of God in God's feminine form. Now, some of the other really driving concerns here are going to be sort of the primordial uh, world prior to the creation of this world, the origin of evil. The Zohar is going to be absolutely interested in evil and demons, 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 all the time in the Zohar, they're going to be interested in trying to reread scripture to kind of discover these ideas that they're mining, right? So you, what you get is these Kabbalists are coming up with these ideas. And so what do they do? They go to scripture and then mine them out, right? They, it's not like they go to read scripture and then find this stuff. Now you talk to a Kabbalist and they'll tell you that's what they do. I think us other scholars say they come up with the ideas and they go to scripture and they mine them out. So we have very innovative hermeneutical ideas that are going to develop in all of this uh, form of Kabbalah, but also a radical reinterpretation of Jewish law. And this is the idea of Ta'ameh HaMitzvot, and Ta'ameh HaMitzvot is explaining the mitzvot, right? Why do we do the things that we do? 
why do we do tefillin? Why do we keep Shabbat? Why do we not eat this? Why do we uh, have, why do we not do shatnets? Why do we uh, don't allow linen and uh, wool to be uh, I'm knitting, I'm knitting together? Uh, why do we not do that? Well, what Kabbalah is going to show is not only are there practical reasons for this, right? There are metaphysical, mystical, occult reasons for this. And that's going to be a big part of the, um, of the Kabbalah as well. <clears throat> well, folks, we've arrived. We are at the gates of the Sefer Zohar. And I will say that um, the Sefer Zohar is an incredibly difficult, incredibly um, intimidating text. And I'll speak for myself. It's intimidating to me. It is a text that I have, uh, I have a, a very tortured relationship with just because it's so difficult to get into. Um, I've never experienced a text that is this intimidating. So as I work through these next couple of lectures, and it will be two lectures on the Zohar, just because I, no one can do service to the Zohar in two lectures, much less an even year or a lifetime of studying the Sefer Zohar. It's that monumental. And I just want to illustrate this with a visual example of why we're going to do at least two sections on the Zohar and why I would love to come back and do an entire class uh, on the Zohar. <clears throat> so to get an idea of this, um, I'm going to hold up just a copy of uh, this right here, this little sliver of text that you see here. This is the longest Kabbalistic text prior to the composition of the Zohar. This is the Sefer Bahir, right? So this is the Sefer Bahir in Hebrew, right? So this is the Sefer Bahir in Hebrew. And what you're seeing here, right, is this is the longest Kabbalistic text prior to the Zohar, right? Now, let's zoom out a little bit. I have to move my mic. This is a Zohar, right? This is the volumes of the Zohar. The standard Zohar, just the standard Zohar with no additions whatsoever, right? Which is still not considered the entire Zohar is still, whoops, all of this. So this is a standard academic Zohar with no commentary, no commentary. That's three substantial volumes in the standard edition of the Zohar. So I just want you to understand at some level what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with, an, we're dealing with several orders of magnitude for the math folks out there of growth in Jewish mysticism. When I say several orders of magnitude, I'm talking about tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of words. So when I say that the Zohar is a, it's, it's, it's like a giant jump in terms of production. And so what I want to make very clear is if we were to add up every single text we've talked about so far in this class, right, with the exception of the Babylonian Talmud, it, it, you could add everything up, multiply it by 10, and we would still not have the contents of the whore. It's that substantial. So what I want to drive home tonight is that if, if, if the case that I'm doing two lectures on the Zohar, which I'm extending the class basically now, the reason why I'm doing it is because I, I can't possibly do justice to the text in two lectures. And if I tried to shove everything into one, I'd be, a, I, it would be, it would, it would be Chelul Hashem. It'd be a, it'd be a, 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 a violation of God's dignity to do that. So we're going to spread it out to two, uh, uh, over co the course of two lectures now, and uh, we'll start with this text. So what is it? The first thing I want to do is do a little groundbreaking. Where are we? When does this text appear? And the answer is it appears somewhere in Castile in Spain around 1270 of the Common Era. And to give you some idea about when we are, right, some cultural landmarks that you probably know, we're in the time period of the groundbreaking of the of the Notre Dame Cathedral. Notre Dame was the, the Notre Dame Cathedral. The groundbreaking was 1163, and it was completed uh, just a little bit later in 1345. So we're right in the middle. So if you were to be reading the first sections of the Zohar, you would still see the Notre Dame Cathedral going up. Baghdad, the most magnificent city in the world in many ways at the time fell to the Mongols in 1258. The Bayit al Hikmah was burned, the most important library in the world, right? People forget this, the most important library in the world, and they don't forget this. It, Islamophobia has denied the right of Muslims 
to claim the most important library in the world being at the Bayd Hukma in, uh, in Baghdad, but it falls in 1258, the Bayd Hukma is burned. Uh, I would say it's actually a greater tragedy than the burning of the Library of Alexandria in many ways. Also, if you want to think about the if, think about it more specifically, <clears throat> the Sefer Zohar is composed almost at the same time that Thomas Aquinas is composing his Summa Theologica, right? So Thomas was composing his Summa Theologica, which is almost the same size in many ways as the Sefer Zohar. And he's composing that from about 1262 to 1263. The Zohar is actually being composed about a decade later. But it boggles my mind to think that the people or pe the person and people that compose the Zohar could have literally walked to one another and chatted over a beer, right? They could have had wine together, right? That boggles my mind. Thomas Aquinas composing the Summa Theologica and the writers of the uh, writer and the writers of the uh, Sefer Zohar could have made a little bit of a journey and they could have sat down and talked about theology over a couple of glasses of wine. And my God, I wish I could have been a fly on the wall of that conversation. So just again, just to give you a com uh, again, I think it's sometimes important to get a sense of when we are, right, when we are, and what's being produced at that time. And of course, the, the Summa Theologica is probably one of the touchstones in Western civilization, philo philosophically and theologically. So the Sefer Zohar appears. What is this book, right? What is this book? Well, it's largely a travelogue, right? That's what's weird about it. It's a travelogue. It's mostly the travels of a second century sage named Shimon Bar Yochai and his son Eliezer and their companions. And what do they do? They travel around second century Palestine and they talk. That's what the Sefer of Zohar is. It's just a bunch of guys traveling around chatting about stuff. Now, what do they talk about? We'll get to that. Why Shimon Bar Yochai? Well, already in the rabbinical period, Shimon Yochai is already associated with a couple of extreme things. He's associated with miracles. He's associated with extreme piety. In fact, he was so pious that uh, he uh, allegedly emerged from a cave and, and, and killed a bunch of people with his judgy laser eyes. Uh, he hated the Romans. He was a sort of bulwark against the Roman uh, assimilation. And in many ways, some documents around Shema Bar Yochai had already been composed to make him a sort of an apocalyptic figure. So in many ways, he's the perfect person to be this progenitor of a radical new kind of mysticism because he's already sort of radically mystical and anti sort of distant from the world. And he, he doesn't like the Gentiles, which uh, the Zohar is very anti-Gentile, infamously anti-Gentile. So in many ways, he's the perfect fit for the Zohar. The uh, text itself is uh, placed into the second century world of the Galilee. And of course, that time is a time of very intense uh, Jewish Roman strife. And so the, the text here is also representing a very difficult relationship between Jews and non-Jews. And that, uh, that situation is going to prove important in just a minute. <clears throat> What do we know about the writer of this? We'll talk more about the author in just a minute. We know that they know rabbinical literature incredibly well, but not only that, they are incredibly conversant in philosophy. One of the things that's really important to know about the, the Sefer Zohar is that the person who writes this really, really, really knows philosophy, and they really, really know Jewish traditional literature. It's only, this text is only possible if you know both. And so one of the things we know about that is they really, really know both. Secondly, the text itself is composed in a strange dialect of Aramaic. It's not Palestinian Aramaic. It's not Babylonian Aramaic. It's Zohar Aramaic. And when I say that, it actually contains all kinds of strange, almost idiolectic um, examples of its own sort of private language to misquote Wittgenstein, and the obscure, weird dialect of the Arab uh, Aramaic, which composes the Zohar, is going to be something we'll talk about in just a minute. <clears throat> 
Now, one thing to know about the Zohar is that it's actually not one text. It's not like you can read the Zohar beginning to ending. The Zohar is actually composed of very small, some big, some small, some only seven pages, some 150 pages. It's, it's a text composed of texts. And what I want to do now is go through some of the texts that compose the Zohar. Because you shouldn't think of the Zohar as one united text. You should think of it as sort of a uh, stitching together of various texts uh, that don't always work together. So the most important section of the Zohar and the largely the biggest section of the Zohar is the Zohar al-Torah. This is a running midrash, right? For midrash is a kind of creative commentary for folks who've studied some midrashim. It's a common running commentary on the Torah with almost all the weight being thrown at Genesis and Exodus. And then after Genesis and Exodus, after Genesis and Exodus, almost the weight of the, the commentary drops off and it's some parts of the Torah are very thinly covered. So it's not like it's a systematic commentary of the whole Torah. Some parts get a lot of cover. Some parts get very little at all. Another part of the text are these, these groups called the Idrot, right? The Idrot are the uh, two assemblies. And these are texts in which the characters of the Zohar get together and have conversations. One of these two assemblies, the smaller assembly, the Idra Zuta, is a very small gathering of uh, people around the death of Shimon Bar Yochai. So it's in some sense the smaller of the two, but the more important one. And the Idra Rabba, which is weirdly enough a discussion of all kinds of things, um, including the um, commentaries on God's beard. There's a long section about God's beard and another section called the Sifra Ditsniuta. And this very tiny part has to do with divine anatomy. And many people think this is a very old stratum of the Sefer Zohar. Um, it's a very weird part of the Zohar. So we have these idrot, which are these uh, assemblies of the sages, and we have this other section called the Sifra Dizniuta, which is, and you can see these words are uh, largely in Aramaic, uh, reflecting the names of the, the sections. And so these sections are very, very unusual and very difficult to understand. I still don't know what they're talking about in half this stuff. It is very, very weird. But on the surface, it's just a bunch of guys getting together to talk about stuff. Right. There's also an early, early, early section of the Sefer Zo of the Sefer Zohar called the Midrash Ha'Na'ilam, the hidden Midrash. The, the hidden Midrash uh, is probably the oldest section of the Sefer Zohar. This section deals with a large degree of things like the nature of the soul, the afterlife, the Messiah. It's sort of like the Zohar learning to be the Zohar. And I often tell people if you want to study the Zohar. Uh, for a beginner, if you want some training wheels to study the Zohar, study the, uh, study the Midrash Hanailam and then move on to other sections because it's much more familiar to you if you've studied some Midrash, uh, but still a very strange section in, indeed. <clears throat> um, other sections of the Zohar that are very important, um, let me make sure I'm not getting this on the slide. Yeah, I'm not. Another section of the Zohar that's very important are the sub the literary subsections, right? So there are a couple of important literary subsections that are very important. And these literary subsections actually include uh, what is called the uh, Sava, the old man, and the uh, Nuka, uh, the young child. It turns out the young child and the old man are in fact related to their son and, and uh, son and child. Um, these sections are where a uh, a young child, a wunderkind, and a old man who are just who's just a donkey driver actually schools the companions. The the men associated in the Zohar are called the companions, and these uh, companions are going along the road. And there's a donkey driver, and the donkey driver actually shows them that the donkey driver knows more about the hidden world of the uh, of God than they do. And the Yanuka, though this wonder kid, also shows that he knows far more about the nature of Torah and the hidden uh, reality of God than they do. And so they sit at the feet of this donkey driver and this child, and they, they learn all this stuff about the nature of, um, of God and the hidden world of the, of the Ein Sof and the Sephirot and things like this. So what's important to know about these sections is that it's, the Zohar is not one contiguous book. It's several 
structural literary texts or fragments edited together into one narrative. The edits are not clear, the edits are not perfect, but they are being edited together into one volume. What's neat about that is it allows you to kind of graduate your study as you get into the Zohar, and, I'll, and I have a kind of graduated study if you're interested in that, <clears throat> where one can uh, get into the more easy section of the Zohar and then kind of work your Zohar muscles up till you get to the really difficult parts like the Sifra Ditsniuta, which is incredibly obscure, or the Idrot, which are not quite so obscure, but still very, very challenging in many ways. So that's the basic structure of the Zohar as we have it. It's a collection of very strange documents. In addition to that, there were sections of Zohar that were not collected together in the original version, which are included in the standard version of Zohar. Those are, are the Tikkunei Zohar, the rectifications of the Zohar, and another text called the Raya Mehemna, or the Faithful Shepherd. These are considered in the Orthodox world to be part of the Zohar. So if you were to go in the Orthodox world and read the Zohar, those sections will be considered part of the Zohar. We now think that they're a bit later than the actual composition of the Zohar, but in the Orthodox world, they're considered Zohar par excellence. There's no one blinks an eye about them. And those later sections um, actually do a lot of work of helping to make the earlier sections of the Zohar make sense. Now, I know this is all really complicated. So let me just say it again, just to break it down a little bit clearer. What we have in the Zohar is a commentary on the, on the Bible. That's weird. Then we have weirder books where a bunch of Second century dudes hang out and talk about even more strange things. And then we have digressions that are literary units that are contained upon themselves, where they make, they, they have a, they have a uh, conversation with a little boy and a donkey driver, and they learn all kinds of secrets of Torah from them. And then we have a lot of miscellaneous stuff. So the thing I want to drive from the Zohar is that it is not one contiguous um, text. It's a, it's a quilt, right? If you've ever seen a quilt, right? Quilts are cool, cool, cool pieces of fabric because they're not one thing. Quilts are lots of things stitched together. And if you zoom in on one part of the quilt, it sounds like you're looking at one thing. And if you zoom out too far, it looks like chaos, right? But if you kind of carefully follow how the quilter made it, you can see how the quilt got designed. But again, if you zoom out on the quilt, it just looks like a bunch of crazy things stitched together. And if you zoom in too close, it looks like it's just things. But zooming out, you can see the structure. The structure of the Zohar is very well understood. And I think the best example of understanding it is something like a mystical quilt. Let's talk about who wrote this thing, right? Who wrote this thing? Um, the earliest appearances of the Zohar occur in the 1290s, uh, but we think that largely it was composed between 1280 and 1286, although probably I think it actually was composed maybe in the in the 1270s. It seems to emanate largely from the person of Moshe ben Shemtov of Lyon who lived in Castile. You see his dates there on the screen. We say that because everything seems to point back to him. Everybody who quotes it, he, him, like him, he quotes it, the world in which it seems to be emanating from seems to be him. And we do think that Moshe ben, Le Moshe ben Shem Shem Tov of Leon is probably the author of a big chunk of this text. And we'll talk more about, we can complicate that more in a minute. Now, <clears throat> one of the things I'll point out here is that even in the early days of the Zohar, there was a lot of doubt about who wrote this. Most people, many people thought it was a forgery right? Many people thought it was a forgery. We'll talk about this more in a minute. So it wasn't like the Zohar was immediately recognized by all Jews as obviously scripture. That took some time. Also, one of the things we should note about it is that let's make a distinction between forgery and pious forgery. Forgery is when you intentionally engage in fraud for your own personal gain. That's forgery, right? When I write a check from I don't know if I were to write a check from Tahia to myself for $10 million, not that that check would pass, but if I were to do that, that's clearly forgery. I'm forging my name on a check to get a bunch of money. But if I were to write a letter forged in someone else's name who was dead to praise someone, 
am I really trying to benefit myself? Not really. I'm really trying to benefit someone who's maybe even dead, right? Pious forgery is not forgery in the benefit of yourself. It's benefit. It's trying to benefit people in the advancement of wisdom or religious fervor or religious piety or spiritual growth. So I want to make a distinction here between forgery, which is meant to only benefit the person doing the forging and pious forging, pious forgery, which is there to actually do the benefit of benefiting other people. It's still deception, but it's pious deception. Now, there's lots of examples of this in the past, and I think the Zohar is typically taken to be an example of pious forgery, though there's some evidence to also say that Moshe ben Leon, Moshe of Leon was also engaging in mystical practices that may have also put him into an altered state of consciousness, and it may be the case that he was also writing the Zohar in an altered state of consciousness. That is to say he was in a mystical trance or an ecstatic state, and he was composing checks, uh, sections of the Zohar in those ecstatic states. We have some evidence to say that's true, too. So, again, people are complicated, folks. People are complicated. Did Moshe de Leon probably write some of this stuff? Yeah. Does that make it a forgery? No. Because forgery and pious forgery and mystical altered states of consciousness really make this complicated. Now, what I want to point out here is some arguments made by Gershon Sholem. And I'm going to go through these really quickly because I don't want to really belabor this point because I don't want to, it's, I, I just, I think it's important to point this out, but I don't want to make a, I just don't want to beat this to, to death. Sholem, who is of course, one of the uh, gaons of uh, Jewish mysticism. He's one of the great uh, pioneers of Jewish mysticism. People forget he was a philologist. His training was in philology. He was not a PhD of Jewish mysticism because nothing existed like that at the time. He was a linguist. And so when he went to study the Zohar and trying to figure out who were the Zohar, he approached it from a linguistic angle and a literary angle. And what he found was it wasn't from the second century. It couldn't have been. It couldn't have been. Why? Why do scholars think this now? So a couple of reasons. I'm going to go through these. I'm, going to, I'm really going to go through these quickly. The first is there are grammatical mistakes that no speaker of Aramaic would ever make. They're just, they're grammatically weird things. Also, there are grammatically blending of dialects that no grammatical no person speaking Aramaic would ever make these kind of blendings. It's like you were from Boston and San Francisco at the same time. No one speaks like that, right? And so in the ancient world, especially, no one from the Galilee would incorporate weird uh, Babylonian grammatical and dialectical structures. Secondly, there are all kinds of neologisms in the uh, Sefer Zohar that are not found in the Babylonian Talmud, and they seem to be made up. In fact, they're not just made up, but there are very specific sounds that the writer of the Zohar likes, right? They're the k, s, f, and t sound. There's something about these sounds that the writer likes. Further, there's evidence of medieval constructions, old Spanish words, and even philosophical ideas that really emerge only in the Middle Ages, specifically in Arabic philosophy. Now, what's really important about that is Moshe de Leon was incredibly well-versed in Maimonidean philosophy, so much so that we even have a copy of his manuscript for the Guide of the Perplexed that survives with his notes on it in Moscow. It's in one of the libraries in Moscow. So Moshe de Leon, the purported major comp compositor of the Zohar, was deeply interested in philosophy, so much so that he had a copy of the Guide of the Blacks by Maimonides written out for him, and he wrote commentary on it. He knows the language of philosophy. He's, in fact, in many ways fighting with Maimonides. And the, the fact that we know this is he read him very closely and left notes behind. And the, the, many of the medieval Ara, Ara, Aramaic, Arabic, and Hebrew words for many of the philosophical technical terms are preserved in the Zohar. <clears throat> Secondly, the writer of the Zohar that we have makes a bunch of mis weird mistakes, and he makes mistakes that no person living in the Galilee would ever make, right? So there are many cases in the Zohar where they say, I'm going from city A to city B, and I'm going east, except for 
you couldn't go east to get there. You had to go north to get there, right? Or you're going from place B, from place A to point B, and you have to go north to get there, and they go west to get there. There's all kinds of geographic confusions in the text that would never occur for someone who actually lived there. It's like saying you're going from Ann Arbor to, I don't know, Traverse City, and you go east to get there. Clearly, this is not a thing anyone would do. Secondly, there's all kinds of interesting confusions about relationships. So one of the big things that ends up happening in the Saber Zohar is that son-in-laws and father-in-laws get switched, right? So that you would, people are married to the wrong people or something. So there are all kinds of familiar relationships that we find in the Babylonian Talmud that just get confused. And, and no one who knew these people would make that mistake. It's like you would confuse, right? It's not like anyone would confuse my brother-in-law, Micah, for my dad, John. No one's going to do that. Um, and so only no one who knows my family would ever do that. And so only someone who doesn't know anything about my family would make a mistake like that. Secondly, uh, the text is, uh, it's, it's in Aramaic, right? But we wouldn't expect a text of the second century to be written in Aramaic. Every academic text written in the second century is actually written in Mishnaic Hebrew, not in Aramaic. So the language of the Zohar is just anachronistic. And we could expect a 7th century text, a 6th century text to be written in Aramaic, or a 5th century text to be written in Palestinian Aramaic, but not a 2nd century one. It's just in the wrong language. Next, well, someone from the outer Jewish world read the Sefer Zohar and did the thing you might do. They were investigative journalists, I guess, and they went to Spain and they were like, let me talk to Moshe de Leon's wife, who seems to these manuscripts seem to be coming from, and they asked Moshe de Leon's wife, where in the world he got this? And she said, he wrote it out of his own head. His wife ratted him out. His wife was like, yeah, he, he, he wrote this for money, basically. People were paying him. He wrote this stuff out and he did this and he used Moshe, he used uh, Shimon Bar Yochai's name to bolster its reputation. So his own wife, after he was dead, said, yeah, there were no ancient manuscripts of this. He, he, he basically made this thing up. I think that's one of the more damning pieces of evidence. Further, the linguistic analysis of the Sefer Zohar shows that the only document that resembles the Sefer Zohar are other documents written by Moshe de Leon. In fact, the earliest quotations we have of the Sefer Zohar are from books written by Moshe de Leon in which Moshe de Leon is trying to make a weird mystical point and he quotes the Zohar to prove him right. Now, that's a cool kind of plagiarism where you write a magical book and then you use your magical book that you wrote to prove your other weird book correct. I got to get on that train because that sounds like an amazing thing to be doing. And so we see that happening in some early text by Moshe de Leon. There are no manuscripts of the Sefer Zohar ever found prior to the period in which Moshe de Leon lived. Every manuscript we have comes from after him. Now, it could be the case that just no one survived from the second century, but, you know. Now, one argument is, right, no one like Moshe de Leon or anyone else could have ever written something profound as the uh, Zohar. Well, people have. The prophet Muhammad was considered was illiterate. He was a trader. He was a merchant. And he wrote the Quran and he was illiterate. Well, Muslims take it to be that the reason why this, the, the, the Quran should be believed is because Muhammad could have never written it because he was an illiterate caravan driver. So simple people, including people like Yaakov Berma, the, uh, the famous theosophist, he was just a cobbler. He made shoes, wrote some of the most profound theosophical writings in the history of the world. So it doesn't take a super smart person to be a genius. In fact, I would say, in many ways, genius has everything to do with being smart in ways that are completely unconventional to the ways around you. Just because no one around you does what you do doesn't invalidate your genius. It might, in fact, authenticate it. So <clears throat> the preponderance of evidence, folks, is that Moshe de Leon, at some level, is responsible for the lion's share of the text that we now refer to as the Zohar. Now, what I want to say here is that 
what we don't believe anymore in the scholarly world is that this is a second century text. What we are now dealing with is the larger question of textual analysis is, did Moshe de Leon write the entire thing? And the growing consensus tends to be no. What we think is now going on is that in Castile, around Moshe de Leon is a circle of people. And that circle of people, uh, like I don't know, the Harlem Renaissance or the symbolist poets or other kinds of people in, in history, they're composing a text jointly in which they're all contributing in all kinds of elaborate ways and they're stitching this thing together as they go. And that's very, in, that's very clear because as we see the Zohar as it's sort of revealed in history, it's not revealed as one book, it's revealed as a bunch of various tractates that ultimately get edited together as the Zohar because they're all unified in terms of theme and uh, philosophical and mystical ideas. So we now, scholarship doesn't believe now that Moshe de Leon wrote the whole thing. That's what Sholem believed. Now scholars who are far more competent than I now believe that what we really have here is a kind of group authorship project, right? A group authorship project in which there are lots of people going and writing things and Moshe de Leon seems to be the center of that group, uh, that group project. And again, you can think about in the 20th century, some of the greatest works of philosophy in the 20th century have been group, have been uh, authored by groups of people. Uh, or by uh, co-authorship. I think of Deleuze and Guattari, I think of, um, of uh, Sartre and, and De Beauvoir, who, who didn't technically group authorship, but I think everything that they ever wrote was already imprinted with each other. De Beauvoir on De Sartre more than people would like to admit, do you like to admit. Um, you can think of other kinds of, of you know, group authorship as well. I will say though, that the orthodox position about this text remains that it was composed in the second century and it was made public beginning in the 13th. That's the orthodox position. The orthodox position is that this text is from the second century and that it was made public beginning in the 13th century. Modern scholarship, academic scholarship does not accept that position, but that is the official orthodox position. Although when it was first printed, it was actually first printed because people thought the Messiah was imminent and they thought we need to get this printed out because it will help the Messiah come. In fact, the earliest printed edition, the Cremona edition was printed at the behest of Christians, not of, of Jews. So it's interesting that even the publication history of this text is, is very complicated. We'll get to the reception of this in, in, a, in a bit. So how does this text develop? And again, I'm already 46, 46 minutes into this lecture. This may be a three-part lecture, folks. Um, so the Sefer, Zohar, the Sefer Zohar is composed of some core ideas. Let's start with the first. The first is Ein Sof. Ein Sof is the modern Hebrew word that means infinite. It literally means without end. And so to understand this, we need to get into the philosophy a little bit and to understand that What's going on philosophically this time is what is generally referred to as negative theology. Negative theology is that you cannot say anything positive about God. God is beyond anything you can say about God. So you can't say that God is wise because any concept you have of wise is always inadequate when compared to God. You can't say that God is loving because any concept you have of love is always inadequate when compared to an infinite being. And so the idea is that you can never say anything positive about God. You can only say negative things about God. You can only say that God is beyond wisdom. God is beyond love. You can't say that God is wise, but you can say that God is foolish. God is not foolish, and God is beyond wisdom. And this negative theology allows one to maintain that God is transcendent, but you can still talk about God, right? By saying that God is beyond wisdom, you can still say that God is wise. God is just beyond wisdom as we understand it. So that's an idea that's being incorporated into the Zohar coming from people like Maimonides and people like, um, uh, people like Ibn Gabirol, but really it has its origins in Neoplatonic philosophy of folks like uh, Plotinus and uh, Pseudo Dionysius, the Christian philosopher. So what's important to note about this, right, is that the starting point of the Zohar is that God is beyond everything you can understand. God is transcendent, utterly transcendent. And so what do we have, right? We have a God in the Zohar that is utterly transcendent. When I mean transcendent, I mean that God is simply beyond anything you can say about God. You can't imagine God. You can't touch God. 
You can't even make sentences about God that are true unless those sentences are in the negative. God is beyond being. God is not in this room. God is not wise because any wisdom attributed to God is beyond all of our wisdom. So this notion of Ein Sof is the positing of a being beyond being. So that's the first thing you should know about the Zohar. For the Zohar, the originary position of God, as much as God has a position, is that God is beyond anything you can articulate, anything you can say, anything you can think, anything you can worship, anything you can obey, anything you can love, anything that you can refer to at all. This being is the luminous darkness, right? And again, notice that beautiful contradiction. It's a darkness, right? It's the most darkness you can imagine. God is beyond all things, absolutely, infinitely dark. And yet God is luminous. God is a being that shines. And so that's the contradiction, right? God is the, the, the lamp that, the infinite dark lamp that shines. And then this contradiction is going to drive the Zohar because God is both beyond all being and yet all being is reliant, is a, re is a result of God. And we have all these beautiful contradictions that we have in the Sefer Zohar to capture this contradictory reality where God is both beyond all predication, and yet everything that can be predicated of anything relies on God. In some sense, this is a God prior to God. So everything you know about God, everything, the Torah, everything. None of that applies to Ein Sof. Ein Sof is beyond all that. Nothing you know about God applies to Ein Sof. Ein Sof is beyond all things that you can possibly think or predicate or imagine. Now, clearly that didn't happen forever, right? Because we're here. I'm here. You're here. Stuff is here. Schmutz on my floor that I need to clean is here, right? So what happened? Well, we don't know. In the infinite abyss of the darkness of God, something stirred, something moved, something agitated. There was an allergy where God sneezed out or crapped out or ejaculated out. And I'm not kidding, ejaculated. The Zohar loves the image of God uh, moving with God's self and light spewing out of uh, Yesod, God's phallus. Um, there's this idea of, of, of our birth, God birthing the world. The Zohar is perfectly comfortable with both of these images, uh, sort of a you know, masturbatory uh, or self-impregnation. And out of that emerges being. The Zohar moves rapidly between these images. Now, one of the great mysteries of the Zohar is why. Why did God flow out of God? And the answer seems to be found, at least at some level, in Neoplatonic literature. And it seems like in the Neoplatonic literature that the, that the infinite darkness, the infinite removal of the Godhead is somehow positively charged. And that positively charged infinite darkness, for whatever reason, flows out of itself, right? It flows out of itself. And that flowing out of itself is something that it can't help but do right? Either it needs to be seen or it, it's so big that it's nothingness must become a something. Um, it's like, a, it's like a, 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 a saucer of milk being put on a pot that boils over. It just has to go somewhere. And so what ends up happening is in this infinite darkness there of Ain So, something flows out. And this outward flow in the Neoplatonic uh, philosophy, it sort of flows out into one thing and then flows out into another. And these discrete things have a relationship back to the thing it flowed out of. And that flowing out eventually reaches a terminus and then it flows back like a tide, right? So there's procession in the Neoplatonic worldview and there's recession back into the world of the infinite darkness of the divine. And we see this in, in scholars like Plotinus, we see it in Proclus, we see it in the Orphic philosophers. But the idea here is there's an infinite negation. And from that negation, that negation itself is negated and then outflows positivity, right? That the negation gets negated and outflows positivity. 
So we see that, right, in some things like the early Neoplatonic philosophers, like the Neopythagoreans, right? We're old, in, in the Neopythagorean philosophy, we have the primordial unity, which is beyond all understanding. And then there's an, an interior duality. And then there's a kind of interior harmonics that emerges from that. So we get being emerging into difference. We have the one becoming the many. We see this in um, in the Neoplatonic world, and of course, here here are some of the schemata you can see uh, that are very famous from the world of Proclus. Uh, this is a, a late classical German philosopher, and also here from Orpheus, where you can see from the one right from the ineffable on this side, there is a flowing out of being. And if you've ever seen images of the Sephirot, this is, looks really really should look really familiar to you. Right, and these images come from Greek philosophy, but we're going to see something very similar emerge in Jewish philosophy as well in the in the Sefer Zohar. Now, as we mentioned last time, the earliest mentions of these kinds of things that flow out of God are the Sfirot, and the Sfirot, right, are these earliest emanations of God. Now, when I say emanations of God, what I want you to hear is something like, imagine that out of a being flows one more discrete being, right? So imagine that out of my inner consciousness emerges the consciousness of myself. The consciousness of myself is distinct from myself. And so we can talk about my consciousness and the fact that I'm conscious of myself as being two distinct things, right? Have you like been in pain, right? Where you're like, my knee is hurting. And then yet your awareness of your knee is hurting is a different thing, right? Sometimes we talk about pain and suffering. Pain is the feeling in your knee. Suffering is you reflecting on the fact that your knee hurts. Folks ever had like a meta, uh, like a meta headache where like your head's hurting and you're like, now I'm aware my head is hurting and I'm thinking about my head hurting, right? Notice how those are distinct things, right? They're just things in your mind, but they're distinct things in the mind. That distinction between the pain and the thinking about the pain, the suffering, that's something like a hypostasis, to use a Greek term. That's a incarnation where the pain and the thinking about the pain are two distinct things. Well, God kind of works like that in Judaism, where we get all kinds of aspects of God, the spherot, and these spherot are aspects of God contemplating God's totality interior to that totality. I know that sounds weird, but think about yourself. Think about your mind. Your mind is consciousness, emotions, intellect, right? Judgment. You judge things to be true or false, right? Uh, memory, right? Do you think about memory? It's experience of the world. Our minds, we also think of our minds as having parts, right? There are parts of our mind doing different tasks. We'll imagine the spherot as something like aspects of God, faculties of God doing different parts that compose what God is. Just like your memory is different than your logical part, just like your logical part is different than your, your emotional part, just like your emotional part is different than your judgment part, where you judge things to be true or false. Those are all part of your mind, but they're distinct, but they're all part of one mind. So the sphere wrote are in many ways like that. Now, of course, as we remember, as we can remember back from a couple of times ago, these ideas first appear in the Sefer Yetzirah. And in the Sefer Yetzirah, the Sefer Yetzirah divides them into 10. We get 10 of these. But notice back then, they are not parts of God yet. They're not emanations of God, but they will become emanations of God, remember, in the Sefer Habahir. Now, what we get here, right, is that what ends up happening is that these 10 numerical ideas that come from Sefer Yetzirah are going to pass into a new stage, right? So the first stage of the Sefer Ot are the numerical ideas of the Sefer of the, of the Sefer Ot, right? In the first stage, the Sefer Ot are combined with the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and God creates the world that way. In the second stage, the Sefer by here is going to link them with the various aspects of God. They are the parts of God that flow out of the inner recess of Ein Sof, the unknowable part of God, and those ten sephirot are going to become the parts of God that we know, right? That we that we can have some intellectual or mystical communion with. <clears throat> 
So that's the second part, right? And this, the sphere wrote, you can imagine in the second part is kind of like a bridge. They build the bridge between the infinite transcendence of God to us, right? So if one metaphor, maybe a metaphor that might help you to understand what the sphere wrote are, is they're like, a, they're like a ladder, right? With every single rung of the ladder, the 10 rungs of the ladder, reaching back up to Ain Sof. So think about the Sephiroth as a ladder reaching down from the infinite recesses of Ain Sof, the infinite recesses of the no-thingness of God to the thingness that we are. Because we have to have a bridge between the finite thingness I am, I'm just a finite thing, just some dude with a beard, right? And God is infinite transcendence. We have to have something to bridge the gap. What bridges the gap? The Sephiroth. The Sephiroth are the rungs of the ladder reaching down metaphysically, ontologically to us. Now, what ends up happening, right, is that you have to define what those rungs are, right? We get, we get the idea that there are 10 of them in the Sefer Yetzirah. We get some sense of what they are in the Sefer Bahir, and it's in the Sefer Zohar that they become clearly systematized, kind of clearly systematized, systematized, and we now know a bit about them. And what the Sefer Zohar argues is that the Sefirot are the primordial body of the universe. They're like the universe before we get to the physical universe. They're like the metaphysical part of the universe. Right. So before there is a physical universe, there is the metaphysical universe. And the spherote exist in that metaphysical universe. They are the uh, primeval body of human beings, the primeval body of, of Adam, the Adam Kadmon, which we'll talk about a little bit later. They're kind of like the, the being of, of, uh, of the, they're the being of reality prior to physical reality. Now, where the rung on the ladder idea begins to break down is that in the Sefer Zohar, the Sefirot are not, um, they're not concrete. You can think about the, the, in many ways, the Sefer Zohar is talking about these various parts of God, right? And we'll talk about some of these parts of God uh, next time, right? This is God's judgment and God's mercy and God's intelligence and God's uh, uh, wisdom and God's beauty and God's uh, endurance. We'll talk about some of these starting next time. These spherot are aspects of God, but these aspects of God, just like the aspects of your mind, right? The logical part of your mind, the memory part of your mind, the emotional part of your mind, the judgment part of your mind. It's not like those parts are always clearly distinguished, right? They interact with each other. They, they kind of move around, right? Memory gets called up and then memory gets informed by logic, but logic sort of tries to rule over emotion, but sometimes emotion rules over logic. And sometimes your logic uh, is very powerful and it's able to overcome your, your temper problem, but sometimes your temper problem is able to overcome your logic. Well, you're made in the image of God. And unsurprisingly, because those things are true of you, they're true of God too. The inner world of the divine, the inner world of the sphero, these aspects of God are also in a kind of dynamism. They're always interacting with each other. They're always moving around. And this is the reason why, and I know that you're probably wondering, why don't you have this image of the spherot on the screen, right? The classic image where there's one sphere at the top, Keter, and then we have Hoka, Bina, da, 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 right? Why don't you have that? Because I want to disrupt that image of the spherot, of the attributes of God, of the, of the qualities of God, the 10 qualities of God as locked into those sequence. Because in the Zohar, they're not. The sequence you've seen, right? The sequence of the, of, the, of the tree of life. We'll talk about that more next time. The tree of life sequence you've seen is the perfectly balanced version, which never occurs. The, the, the spherot in the Zohar are always moving, shaking, dancing, crying, screaming, judging, uh, contemplating, uh, intellectuating, being beautiful and fabulous, uh, engaging in prophecy, uh, gloating over the future of the coming of the Messiah. None of them are ever in one place. They're moving and gestating and dancing and being always in a relationship that's moving and dynamic. 
So the thing I want to notice here about the Sphero, the 10 Sphero, and the thing I want to drive home tonight is that image that you probably have of the Sphero, Keter, Chochma, Bina, da 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 Malchut. You need to get rid of that image if you want to stand the Sefer Zohar, because that image is like, it's, it's like looking at a map, right? And trying to figure out where you want to go, right? Where you want to go is like this. And then where you want to go another day is like this. And where you want to go another day is like this, right? The, 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 the sphere wrote in the Zohar are not fixed things. Where, you want, where the divine is, is always moving. So attached to all the different spherot are an incredibly rich, complicated system of names, of colors, of numbers, of names of gods, of locations and body parts, of emotions, of partner spherots, of various patriarchs and matriarchs found in the Hebrew Bible. And every time you see them, they're changing, right? So when you read the Zohar, you might see that one patriarch gets named and that's associated with one specific sphera, right? Or a specific region of the body or a specific color. And what ends up happening is that these things are dynamic. There's a dynamism. And so part of how to read the Zohar is how to decode this stuff, which can take a long, long, long time to figure out. Now, what is the relationship between Ein Sof and the spherot? Well, it's complicated, right? Uh, you have to resort to metaphors, right? We're dealing in the world of poetry and art, and the metaphors are things like light, white light breaking into a spectrum, or uh, one candle lighting another one, right? So the the infinite dark candle that you can never see of Ein Sof reaches out into being, right? From non-being, from trans being, from from ultra being, and it lights the light of Keter, and Keter is a light that burns so bright you can't even see it. So it's a light, but it's a light so bright you can't see it, but it lights another light, Chokhmah, and that light is so bright that you can't look at it, but you know it's a light, and that light lights Bina. That's again so bright, right, but you can kind of look kind of through your fingers and see it. So what we have here is, again, a metaphor of lights lighting light. Other kinds of things are fountains, right? So you have the very tip fountain, right? The very top of the fountain that spreads just a tiny bit of water that you can hardly see, right? But eventually it fills the first bowl and the first bowl fills the second and the second and the second and the second, and the second right? Until you get all 10. But that first spigot of water, you can't even see it. But eventually it fills the first bowl, right? And so what we have here is the idea of God's divine being spraying out, right? Um, lactating out, right? Uh, ejaculating out, right? The language is always mixed in the Zohar. We'll talk about gender in the Zohar next time, right? But the, there's a tiny jet that you can't detect, and yet it fills all of being. So God is always beyond all being, and yet fills all being. It's a very important concept on the Zohar, right? Crowns nested upon each other like, uh, like Russian dolls are the divine body. Uh, itself. And again, the way the Sephirot relate, you can think of them as flowing from one, from one another, right? You can also think of them as nesting upon each other like Russian dolls. So it, again, it always depends. The Zohar is always moving around about how it wants to depict itself. And I know that you want me to be showing an image, a visual image of the, of the tree of life on the screen. I'm not going to do it yet because part of what I want to do is show you that that image is not trustworthy. In fact, we go back a couple of slides. That's one of the earliest depictions of the Sephirot in history, right? It's not the tree of life. It's an Esadol version, right? With Keter, right? Flowing all the way down to Malchut at the bottom or in the center, right? Not the bottom, the center. Because again, no up, no down, no left, no right, no beginning, no end. This is God, right? So I know the image you've seen, right? is probably that image. Right? That's the image that most people have seen. Something like this image, right? Keter, Chochmah, Bina, and it flows like this. This is an earlier image, just as representative of the Sephirot as this one. This is the more famous one. I think that one's just as valid, right? With Keter, right, being here. Notice Keter is at the top, right? And Malchut is at the bottom. Here, Keter is on the outside, but Malchut's in the middle. 
Notice how that totally changes how we think about the relationship between these aspects of God. And again, both of these are completely accurate when we think about the structure of the divine and the Sefer Zohar. Now, just to begin to wrap up for the night, we're a little over. Uh, you can imagine the Zohar is something like a drama, not like a soap opera, actually, right? Uh, One Life to Live or I don't know, whatever, whatever soap opera you like, right? Dark Shadows, that's my favorite soap opera. Um, um, Barnabas Collins is a jam. Um, so you can think about the Zohar as a kind of soap opera. I can still, I can now hear the the Dark Shadows song, a song in my in my in my mind. Um, so at any rate, you can think of the Zohar as a kind of soap opera of these spherot. It's all about how the various aspects of the divine relate to each other, hurt each other, double cross each other. Uh, how they move, how they dance, how they love, how they fight, how they interact with a harmony, how they uh, excite each other, how they stimulate each other, how they seduce and betray one another. The Zohar is the drama of the Sefirot. And also the goal of the Zohar is how to harmonize them. Right now, I know that no good soap opera wants a harmony because that's drama free. But what the Zohar imagines is that at the end, the whole at the end of this process, the Sphero will be harmonized. They will they will be harmonized. And I bet you even heard right in, in those days, God's name will be one. Right. Right. That God's name will be one and God will be one. That's a Kabbalistic idea. Because the idea is that in the end of time, God's name will be unified and God, God's self will be unified. Now, what's interesting about that is that God is not unified yet. God's name is not unified yet. And how does God get unified? That might give us a clue about why Ain Sof ever erupted from Ain Sof at all. It's because God needs us that we are part of the divine drama. And how, what part do we play in the divine drama? We are God's wife, right? We are the wife of God. Israel is the wife of God. And many parts of the Zohar are about this amalgamation of the male and the female, this uh, trans movement of maleness and femaleness in which those two things unite themselves in an androgyne being. And that androgyne being is us and God. And how do we do that? Well, the Zohar is very conservative. The answer is you scrupulously follow Jewish law. Right? Don't expect some hippie dippy stuff here, folks. Don't get, uh, don't go on down the road. We're going to like smoke reefer and free love and do some drugs and trip out and have fun. No, the Zohar is scrupulous about Jewish law. You unite God, you bring together God, you reunify yourself spiritually, and then you reunify God by following Jewish law scrupulously. And not just scrupulously, but the most irrational, strange laws in the Hebrew Bible are for the Zohar the single most important. Tefillin, right? You got to attach boxes to your arm and your head. Yeah. Why? doesn't matter. There's no logical reason. And it's precisely because there's no logical reason that the illogic of it actually makes it mystically transcendent. And therefore, tefillin becomes an incredibly important part of mystical Judaism. Um, for folks also doing Shabbat, the observance of Shabbat becomes also incredibly, incredibly important. And if you've ever seen uh, Chabadniks, I don't know if everyone's ever been like met some Chabadniks on the street, right? Where they want the guys to lay to felon and they give the women um, uh, Shabbat candles. Well, because they're Kabbalist, because they think that by putting on those to felon, by putting those to felon on you, by getting a woman to light Shabbat candles, because the gender roles are all the thing. If they do that, if you do that, you're unifying God and you're bringing the world one step closer to redemption. So don't expect Jewish mysticism to be liberal, hippy-dippy, you can do what you want. It's actually the exact opposite of that. 
It's radically conservative, which by the way, should not surprise anyone here who's understood anything about mysticism in the Middle Ages. Every mystic in the Middle Ages is radically conservative, Christian, Muslim, Jewish. They're all incredibly socially conservative. In the Christian world, there were no more enthusiastic people about the Inquisition and the Crusades than Christian mystics. They were all about it. So this is not surprising if we look at the, uh, the other mystics in their, in their neighborhood. Now, what I want to pick up with next week is I want to pick up with a very short explanation of the spherot, right? Because tonight I just want to break down the idea that there's a configuration that you need to memorize at Keter and then Chochmah and then Bina and blah, 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 Chesach, Nod, Yesod, Malchut. I, I want to break that idea up. Right. In fact, I don't even show it to you. We'll get to it next week because I want to tell you what I want to drive home is that in the Zohar, the, the emanations of God are dynamic. They are a soap opera and soap operas only work because they're dynamic, because characters are falling in love and double crossing, getting angry, getting jealous, getting freaked out, making out with whatever. So think about God as an interior, the God's interiority of the soap opera and that Jewish law is organized around balancing that out. That's the best way of thinking about it at this point. We'll talk about those distinctions next time, but imagine God's life as God is a soap opera and you doing Jewish law is harmonizing it. That's the best way to think about the way the Zohar actually frames it. Let's not make the Zohar say something it doesn't, because it, it does not imagine a, a steady structure of these God, these divine things. I put a sheet, I put a cheat sheet up, right? A cheat sheet about the Sephirot. We're going to go through the next time, right? We're going to go through all the uh, Sephirot next time. I'll talk a little bit about each one of them, but again, I want to drive home that we're going to go through them next time. But at this point, what I really want you to use the metaphor of is that this is a soap opera not a structure. Because if you imagine it as a structure, you get the Zohar wrong. It's a soap opera. Furthermore, we are not done yet, folks. If you think this is the, the entire Zohar, you are way off kilter. Um, we still have to deal with uh, Shekhinah, right? That is to say, we have to deal with God's feminine aspect, the feminine reality of God, and the queering of God that goes on in the Sefer Zohar, the fact that God is not he or she, or even they, God is all of those and beyond those. We have to deal with the question of the mitzvot, which we've already touched on a little bit tonight. How does Jewish law relate to the Sefer Zohar? Obviously, another thing that's very important about the Sefer Zohar is its attention to evil. Evil is very important to the Zohar. And in fact, they imagine that this spherot, right, the, the positive attributions of God, have an inverse version of them, a bizarro version, a backwards version, an inverted version, a negative image. And that negative image is called the Sitra, Achra, the other side. And that negative image of God is the realm of the demonic. And so we're going to talk about Jewish demonology and the world way in which the negative image of God is that world of the demonic. And of course, we have to talk about how this text got received. This is one of the strangest texts in all of Jewish history. How did this text get received? And I think more importantly, how did it become canon? How did it become Jewish scripture? And it is. But also how in the progressive world did it cease to be scripture? Why is it that you've never learned Zohar? Why is it that in the, your, your camp or in your shul or in your temple, you would learn prophets, you would learn Torah, you might learn some Talmud, but you would never learn Zohar. How did it, how did it get decanonized? We always wonder about how texts don't get canonized. The Zohar made it through the ringer. It got canonized. How did it lose that status among progressive Jews? And why should we claim it back? So we're going to deal with those issues next time, because I think it's very important about how this text got canonized and then lost it among progressive Jews, who I think would benefit from it the most. Welcome back, and thank you for joining me as I explore the garden that is Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah. Again, if you'd like to support my work of providing accessible, free, and scholarly content on topics like Kabbalah, alchemy, and the occult, along with magic and hermetic philosophy, 
consider supporting my work on Patreon or perhaps with a one-time donation. You can find those links below. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and thank you for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.